Uh, my name is Carl Golnick from the United States, uh, and thank you for attending this seminar or symposium on pearls for neuro-ophthalmology. Uh, we've got a great lineup of speakers, uh, and I am going to start off talking about the history, uh, which is a talk I've actually never given. So I have no financial disclosures, um, and my objectives are that when we're done, you'll be able to list at least five pearls for taking a neuro-ophthalmic history. The first pearl is take one. So my residents sometimes, they'll, they'll talk to the patient, what's wrong? My vision's blurry. Okay, let's look at those eyes, and that's it. So take a history, and I tell people, and I tell my residents, there's really nothing magic about neuro-ophthalmology, except that we take a detailed history and do a thorough exam. So neuro-ophthalmology is not magic. We ask questions that other doctors don't ask, and that's oftentimes how we make the diagnosis. So just before you even take the history, if you have previous records, review them. Patients like it. They, they think, oh, this doctor cares about me. He's looked at this in advance. Um, I now do not schedule patients unless I have their past records. They, I have to have the past records to schedule the patients. But it's like they taught in med school, in medical school. What's the character, the timing? Are there relieving and exacerbating factors for every symptom? That's what it means to take a good history. Now, another pearl is this, what I call the arm gesture. So I have, I've had fellows in neuroophthalmology, and they always say, you know, I go into that room, I, I ask questions, I get the history, and then you go in and you get all this information I didn't get. How, did, how do you do that? And I said, well, I always ask them, is there anything else going on? And they, I ask them that. And then they start talking about, well, it hurts a little bit around my eye, maybe. And I said, aha. I said, the problem is, you're not using the arm gesture like this. The rest of you, is there anything going on with the rest of you? Because you're an eye doctor. And patients, and I've had patients come from my waiting room where my diplomas are. Oh, you went to medical school. I thought you were an eye doctor. So that's the way it can work in the United States. So yes, I really want to know about the rest of you in neuro-ophthalmology. It's not just your eyes. So the arm gesture for associated symptoms. Is there anything else going on? And then another pearl, I think, is to remember this, that, you know, and, and I think we're taught this, the chief complaint may not be the same as the referring diagnosis. So I, I always get a referring diagnosis, and I go through everything, and at the end, I start talking, to them, and they say, well, that's not really why I'm here, you know, my eye hurts, or something like that. Make sure that the referring diagnosis and the uh, chief complaint are the same thing. And if they're not, you're going to have to try to deal with both of those problems to make the patient happy. And then, of course, you want details on anything in their past ocular or neurologic history. It's not enough, why did you have an MRI? I had an MRI three years ago. Why did you have an MRI of your head? Maybe that's relevant to why they're sitting in your chair right now. Is there a family history of visual loss? Could it be a mitochondrial problem and you're interested in the maternal family history in particular? What about the social history? And this is sometimes some of these things um, sexually transmitted diseases, the use of Viagra. I've had patients deny, 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 and then call me. How important is that Viagra use? I, you know, I do use Viagra, but I didn't want to admit it in front of my wife. So sometimes you got to be careful about getting the social history, and people may not admit things to you if their family is sitting there in the room. And I want to talk about three sort of common presentations, things that are probably the, I don't know, the three most common things I see maybe, and that is visual loss, double vision, and weird symptom X, Y, or Z. So neuro-ophthalmologists, I think, I do, see a lot of weird things, unexplained stuff. I just gave a talk on unexplained vision loss, but I, we see all sorts of just unexplained stuff that could remotely be related to your vision. Uh, I'll mention some of those towards the end. So visual loss. So, of course, we're going to want to know, is it unilateral or bilateral? I say, beware homonymous hemianopsias. Why? Because we've all seen patients who say, oh, my, I have a problem with my right eye. What do you mean? Well, I can't see to the right. It's my right eye only. And so clearly, we can quickly, if, we, if it's constant, if the visual loss is constant, we can do our visual field testing, and we, I'll show the patient. I often show them, if it's to the right, I'll show them the right eye and say, yes, of course, you have a problem to the right. And then I show them the other eye. Oh, it's both eyes. The other time this is important is when people come in and we see lots of people with transient visual loss. I have transient visual loss in my right eye. Oh, maybe it's amaurosis fugax. Tell me about when you say transient. Well, when I'm, when I'm 
it's to the right, in my right eye. And I, the question I ask them is, so if you were to look at me or a clock, would you see the whole, with both eyes open during an episode, would you see the whole clock? Oh no, I can't see the right side of it. Ah, well if you can't see the right side of it with both eyes open, it must be both eyes. And I, I make them blind in their bad eye, the right eye, and say, do you see the whole clock? Yes, well then it must be going on to the right in both eyes. So the differential diagnosis is gonna be quite different if they have a transient homonymous amenopsia, perhaps, than if they have truly monocular transient visual loss. So the duration, how long has this been going on? How long, if it's transient, how long does it last? What's the shortest and what's the longest? Is it seconds? Something we might see with transient visual obscurations and papilledema? Is it minutes? Something we might see with embolic amaurosis fugax? Is it hours or days? Or is it constant? And of course, beware of the sudden onset. You know, we all have patients who, uh, it happened yesterday. How do you know? Well, I was washing my face and I covered my left. Oh, I can't see out of my right eye. And you look at their nerve and it's atrophic. And you know that this process has been going on for much longer. But you still want to get the history. You want to know what the patient thinks. Uh, the onset. This has gradually been going on for the last six months. My vision has been getting blurrier, blurrier. Something you might hear with a compressive lesion versus I woke up with this two weeks ago today, painless, sudden loss of vision. And then the character, so how, how bad is it? Because somebody, oh my vision, it's terrible. Could you see, I asked people, could you see me sitting here when it happened? Oh, I could see you sitting there. Could you see if I have a mustache? Uh, I'm not sure I could see that. Could you tell time on the clock? Exactly how bad is the vision loss? And is it central, is it peripheral? Um, is there some pattern to it if it is intermittent? Are there relieving or exacerbating factors? So sometimes people will say it's, it's not double vision, it's blurry. What happens when you close an eye? Oh, when I close an eye, I'm fine. Either eye. Ah, there must be a problem with the binocular status. Maybe it's not loss of vision in either eye. Maybe it's just that they're having some binocular uh, vision problems and having a little uh, horizontal or vertical uh, misalignment. Does it get worse when they do something, change their position, like transient visual obscurations in papilledema. They bend over, my vision gets blurry for 10, 15 seconds. Does it always happen at a specific time of day? It always happens at 10 p.m. when I wake up. I usually tell people, well, it's probably not something too terrible, but it always happens at 10 o'clock when you wake up. Bad things don't care what time it is and don't have follow that sort of a pattern. And then, of course, we always, we've talked earlier in the earlier symposium about giant cell arteritis. We all, anybody I see, with transient loss of vision, transient double vision, constant double vision, constant, or transient double vision, I want to have a, at least a negative review assistance for giant cell arteritis, Are any new headaches, jaw claudication, problems chewing, not, not just pain with chewing. Remember, jaw claudication is not just pain. It could just be weakness. I had a retired judge once who, I had the records, he denied pain with chewing, and they thought, well, okay, he probably doesn't have it. And then he lost vision, and then he saw me. And I said, well, are there any, any problems chewing? And he said, oh, yeah. He said, I can't chew my cornflakes, my cereal in the morning. I said, well, it says in the note you have, you have no, no problems. He said, no, I, they asked me about pain. They didn't ask me about problems. And he was a judge, so he wasn't going to give any information that wasn't directly asked for. Uh, so I said, so you can't chew? No, I can't chew because it just gets weak. That's jaw claudication. Um, TIA, transient ischemic attacks. Are there other things going on? Here's the arm thing. Any other symptoms? Transient numbness, tingless in your extremities. Uh, color desaturation. We mentioned um, in the earlier uh, symposium, I have patients who come in and the, the wife or the husband says, yeah, they turn the color way up on the TV. I can't even watch it because there's so much color because they've lost their color vision from an optic nerve problem. Double vision, so of course the, the most important question is, is it monocular or binocular? Does it go away when you cover either eye? Not one eye, because patients will say, oh, it's my right eye, how do you know? I, I, I close my right eye, I'm fine. What about when you close your left eye? Oh, I didn't try that. Oh yeah, it goes away then too, so it's binocular. But if it's there with either eye covered, it's monocular, that's not gonna be neuro-ophthalmologic, neuro and I reassure them. So my screeners, when they schedule patients to see me for double vision, Always ascertain by phone, does your double vision go away when you cover either eye? If it does not, if it's present monocularly, the patient is told, ask your doctor why you're sending Dr. Golnick 
a neuro-ophthalmologist, someone with monocular double vision. And usually if I do see the patients and they do get to me, I'll say, is it kind of ghosting or superimposed? Yes, that's it, you're good. That's gonna be monocular double vision. Is it horizontal or vertical? I like to ask that because if it's horizontal, it eliminates those wacky oblique muscles. Is it near versus distance? Is there a problem with convergence or divergence insufficiency? And then is it comitant? So I don't ask the patient, is it comitant? I ask the patient, does it, does it change depending on where you, where, where you're the position of your head or where you're looking? I've had engineers bring in cosine, sine, tangent drawings like this one to try to explain it. I say, just tell me, I don't understand that drawing. So sometimes the patients will tell you whether it's comitant while you're taking the history by saying nothing because they'll have a head position, right? Their chin will be up in thyroid eye disease because that's where their misalignment is smallest or they have a fourth nerve palsy or a gaze palsy. So they'll tell you can, from the history, you don't even have to ask them, you can just watch their head position. Is the double vision constant? Is it intermittent? Is it the duration? I think one of the most important questions I have about the double vision, if it's, if it's constant, is has it been there for three months or less or more? Because that's, we see lots of microvascular cranial nerve palsies. And three months for me is kind of the limit. So once they start having the double vision is, oh, it's been four months, five months, six months, two years. All of that differential diagnosis for microvascular cranial nerve palsies, I'm putting to the side. I no longer am gonna be thinking about those things. If it's lasting more than three months, less than three months, then those are all in the differential diagnosis. What is the rate of onset? Did it, did it start when you woke up? Has it been gradually occurring just like with loss of vision, is this compressive and perhaps if it's going on over a long period of time. And then the arm gesture again, are there associated symptoms? Is there some sort of weakness on one side of the body that might tell us there's a problem with the brain stem? Something like that. And then transient weird symptom X, Y, or Z. I mean, I've seen people who only see what, uh, pink spots on white walls at 3 p.m. Uh, we see all sorts of wacky stuff. And I think, as in thinking about this slide, I mean, I say character, pattern, duration, relieving, exacerbation, but that's true for pretty much any <laughs> symptom. So if they've got five symptoms, you want to ask about what is it like, what's the pattern, how long does it last, is it constant, anything makes it better, anything makes it worse. So when I have my residents present patients, I expect to hear that about every symptom the patient might have. So the pearl summary is take one, take a history, not just your vision's blurry or I've got double vision, take a history. Constantly refine your differential diagnosis. That's what history's all about. So I'm constantly thinking, okay, it's less than three months. It's more than, that means I'm gonna eliminate these things. Okay, what other questions am I gonna ask? Like they taught us in med school, character, timing, relieving, and exacerbating factors are all important. So take a good history and be a neuro-ophthalmologist. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Our next speaker will be Valerie Purvin from the US, and she will speak on the afferent visual pathway, pearls in neuro-ophthalmology. I, <clears throat> I always start by pulling down the microphone. Don't know why. Um, uh, I'd like to start by um, thanking the organizers for inviting me to be here today. It's a great pleasure to be in Nice. My talk today concerns afferent visual system, specifically pearls, and my, I've organized my talk uh, by presenting specific cases, and each of these will have a specific takeaway message, hence the pearl for each one. This first case concerns a 62-year-old woman who reported sudden visual loss in her right eye one year ago. She didn't think it had changed since that time. She had a, history, a long history of headaches that were occasional, brought on by stress, relieved with caffeine. No systemic symptoms, specifically no symptoms consistent with giant cell arteritis. On exam, she had a partial inferior altitudinal field defect in the right eye and disc pallor on that side. The left eye was completely normal. And the question is, what is this? I suspected she had non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. It certainly fit the facts. It fit the, the, the history that, that you just heard, the importance of the history. She thought it was sudden onset. So that was the working diagnosis. And the more specific question is, does this patient need a scan? Is it important to image? 
And I don't know how you all practice, but I don't scan everybody with, with the anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. It's usually not necessary. But I thought this one was necessary, and it's a good thing that we did, because this wasn't NAION. This patient actually had a large meningioma <coughs> compressing her right optic nerve. This meningioma was removed, and the vision improved substantially despite the presence of optic dyspallor. So in this case, the pearl, the specific takeaway is that I learned, and I learned it from this particular case, is don't diagnose AION unless you see the disc edema or somebody else saw it. Somebody has to have documented that stage of the illness because disc pallor itself is totally nonspecific and an inferior altitudinal defect, although common in AION, is also nonspecific. A lot of different conditions can do that. So somebody has to have seen the disc edema. It's a good rule. Just keep that rule and it'll keep you out of trouble. Here's a second case that's kind of related. This patient was a 48-year-old hypertensive diabetic man who presented with painless visual loss in the right eye for 10 days. He had also a partial inferior altitudinal defect in the right eye. He did have the, the required, we said we needed to see the disc edema for AION, and he had disc edema that was even segmental. The top half of the disc is swollen, the bottom half not so much. All findings in his left eye were normal, and so the question is the diagnosis here. So is this AION? He had no symptoms of giant cell, and he's, he would really be too young for that disease. So the diagnosis, I think, is non-orderitic AION. We're fine with that. And the question here is whether you're done. Is that good enough? Do you need, does he need anything else? And the, his picture is here really for a purpose, because that should spark your interest and suggest maybe what else is needed, which really goes back to Dr. Golnick's lecture he needs more history. With the help of his wife, his wife reported that, in fact, he snores prominently, including apneic spells. He described excessive daytime somnolence. He has morning headaches, and he had a recent weight gain. So yeah, this is a NAION, but it's also obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. Sleep apnea syndrome is a fairly common condition. It has complex downstream cardiovascular effects which means that it's an independent risk factor for hypertension, for heart attack, for stroke. And it turns out it's also a risk factor for non-arteritic AION. So it's important to think about this when you make a diagnosis of NAION. Furthermore, it's, we think that identification and treatment of the disorder might help to decrease the risk in the fellow eye of a similar event, which is substantial. So think about that. The pearl here is in any patient with NAION, consider sleep apnea. Ask the questions, as we did for that gentleman, history of snoring, morning headaches, excessive somnolence, and recent weight gain all correlate with positive sleep studies. And then consider a formal sleep study if you're still concerned. And just that, that patient, that photograph, I included it because he is kind of a poster child. I don't know if that, how that translates to other languages, but a poster child for sleep apnea. He looks just like the guy with sleep apnea with a thick, stocky neck, but not everybody with sleep apnea looks like that. So don't, don't exclude it just because somebody had a skinny neck. Okay, case number three. This is a 14-year-old boy who presented with decreased central vision in the left eye for three days. He had a little bit of an ache, an awareness of that eye, but no real pain and no pain with eye movement. On exam, vision in that left eye is 2400 and he has a large central, secocentral scotoma in that eye, and a very swollen left optic disc. All findings in the right eye were normal. So the question is, is this optic neuritis? He kind of wants to be optic neuritis. It's a healthy young person with acute monocular visual loss and a swollen disc. So are we okay with that? And the way my residents usually can tell from how I ask the question that the an what the answer is. No, it's, it's not okay. There is something wrong with it. And but so the more specific question is, what's wrong with this being optic neuritis? There's actually two things. One is his minimal pain, a little bit of ache, but most optic neuritis, about 90% of optic neuritis has eye pain, usually worse with eye movement. And maybe even more importantly, his visual loss is out of proportion to the relative afferent pupillary defect. He's got big time visual loss, 2400 giant central scotoma, but only an ipsy-pipsy little relative afferent pupillary defect. 
So if that visual loss was neurologic, he'd have a large RAPD. So what that finding tells us is that even though his disc is swollen, yeah, we understand his optic disc is saying, it's me, it's, it's over here, but that's not where his visual loss is coming from. So he had macular edema, and it doesn't matter if you can see it, and it doesn't matter if you see it, if the, if the OCT machine maybe isn't working that day. You don't need technology to know that. You already know it from the, from the pupil, the, the, the pro disproportion between the RAPD and the visual loss. So he has, he has some sort of optic neuropathy, but that's not what his visual loss is from. And if you just wait for it, you'll figure it out, because 10 days later, this is initial, 10 days later, his disc edema is resolving, but that the lipid portion is flowing over, being carried over by macrophages into the macula to form this macular star figure. So that's the diagnostic feature of neuroretinitis, which is very different from optic neuritis, particularly in that it does not have anything to do with multiple sclerosis. People with neuroretinitis have no increased risk for MS. It's a totally different disease. The target tissue is vascular, not neurologic. Usually painless, plus or minus systemic symptoms, fever, headache, muscle aches, and the most common cause is cat scratch disease. So that's neuroretinitis. This next case is related. This is a kind of similar case. This is a 15-year-old girl who was referred because of blurred vision in both eyes for two weeks. She has two dogs and a cat, and the referring physician ordered cat scratch titers. The blood test is pending. She does have bilateral macular stars. So is this bilateral neuroretinitis? We just saw a typical case of, mon of unilateral. Is this a bilateral one? And this case functions as a reminder that even though a macular star is the hallmark, the defining feature of neuroretinitis, it's not specific for that condition. There are other conditions that cause a macular star, specifically the, the ones listed here. So papilledema, increased intracranial pressure can do that, especially in young people with a very robust neurofiber layer. It occasionally does that in AION, although it's usually a partial star and it doesn't usually do that. But importantly, hypertensive retinopathy certainly can cause bilateral macular stars. In this case, the extra test that was done was a blood pressure measurement. She was referred in with blood pressure measured at 120 over 80 by her optometrist, by the neurosurgeon. Um, but in fact, it was 240 over 160. So the diagnosis here is hypertensive retinopathy causing bilateral macular stars. She had glomerular nephritis as the cause of her massively elevated blood pressure. And the pearl is, when you find yourself about to diagnose bilateral neuroretinitis, check the blood pressure. And if it's 120 over 80, check it again. Even if you already checked it, someone else checked it, just do it again. Because the odds are it's hypertension. Bilateral neuroretinitis does exist. It could happen. It's not that that's impossible. But that's, it's not dangerous, to, and that's not the direction you'll go wrong on, and it's certainly uncommon. Okay, next case, case number five, is a 45-year-old woman who complained of <clears throat> progressive trouble seeing for the past two years, but she was 20-20 in both eyes. So she had new reading glasses prescribed, artificial tears, she had more reading glasses, she had more tears, she was told to use the tears more often, but eventually she saw a new eye doctor who did a visual field test, which in fact was not normal. Her visual field test showed a bitemporal hemianopia, indicating a chiasma lesion. That led to an MRI scan, which revealed the expected pituitary tumor. The pearl here is in any patient with unexplained visual symptoms or with visual symptoms out of proportion to the exam findings, do a visual field. And that's safe, safe word, <coughs> words to keep, uh, to keep you out of trouble. So why, why do neuro-ophthalmologists make such a big deal about testing fields? We're always urging people to test fields, test them again, keep track of them. Well, there's a few, few reasons. One is that some conditions, such as this one, this pituitary tumor, have a distinctive pattern. And you could localize and diagnose just from the field. Some conditions spare central vision until very late in the course, such as papilledema and glaucoma. And if you didn't check the visual field, you would diagnose it and figure it out way too late. And then in some conditions, visual fields are useful for monitoring visual loss over time. 
This is particularly important when we follow patients with papilledema, such as we often see with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So what's being watched usually is here's the papilledema, and with treatment and over time, it gets better. And that's great, and everybody feels good about that. That's what you want to happen. But it's good to keep in mind there's another mechanism for papilledema getting better, as shown here. The papilledema is made up of axoplasmic stuffiness. It's axoplasm in the, the disc. When the disc dies, the, the neurons go away. They get retinal ganglion cells. The axons disappear, and the axoplasm disappears, and the disc edema goes away. That's not a happy ending. That's not a good sign. The, the papilledema went away because the optic nerve died. So there's these two scenarios, and what we want is for our patients to be following this first one, this happily, lived happily ever after optic disc, and not this sad, puny second one where the optic nerve has turned atrophic and visual uh, vision has been permanently lost. When you get to this end stage, we can usually tell the difference just by looking, whether it's fundus photographs or an OCT. We know this is a happy optic disc, nerve fiber layers preserved, and this one looks pale and, and thinned and puny. But what we want to know is in here, during, during the process, as the patient is going from here to here, or are they going from here to there? So in order to figure out this in-between uh, progression, it's important to be also measuring optic nerve function as well as optic nerve structure. And PEARL is in IIH, it is crucial to monitor disc function as well as structure, and in this context for papilledema, Function means visual fields. Again, that's one of the conditions, like glaucoma, where the damage won't show up in the central vision, won't show up as a change in acuity till very late. And then next to last, this is a case is a 19-year-old boy who had multiple episodes of twinkling in his far left peripheral field. Sometimes the twinkling happened several times a day. Sometimes he went for a few days without any. Lasted anywhere from two to five minutes. There were no precipitating factors, he didn't have headaches, and he had been followed with a diagnosis of migraine. So this is like the other, this is a question, do, are you okay with that, is, is that migraine? And again, as with most of those kinds of questions, it's not okay, so what, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with this being migraine? And a couple of things should strike you, it's too frequent and too brief. So, in, so that bought him, this atypical nature bought him a scan, his MRI scan, in fact, showed the responsible lesion. There's a small uh, little popcorn shape. This is an arteriovenous malformation deep in the right occipital lobe that's kind of irritating, tickling the occipital lobe and firing off these photopsias randomly every once in a while. So this is a reminder that even though migraine is a common condition and it does cause photopsias in many cases, but other disorders cause photopsias as well. In this boy's case, the episodes were too often and too brief. The most distinctive feature of migraine is the, is the time course, the slow spread from the beginning of the attack over time, usually 15, 20 minutes, sometimes up to half an hour. The distinctive feature is the slow spread. The headache doesn't help you. Plus or minus headache, other things that cause twinkles can also cause headache. A lot of migraine doesn't have headaches. That one's not helpful, but the time course here is, is, is key. And then finally, an another patient with photopsias, this is a 22-year-old woman with constant twinkling in the right eye. She'd had it for several years when I saw her. That twinkling coincided with this large blind spot that she had noticed and we captured on a visual field that corresponded to this area on her multifocal ERG of m m a much decreased loss of amplitude. So this is acute zonal outer occult retinopathy, Azor which is uh, a disorder of the outer retina that typically causes photopsias. The bottom line here is that the brain can't generate continuous photopsias. It gets tired. It could do it for a few minutes. It could do it for 20 minutes. It just can't keep going, but the retina can. The retina can do this all day, every day, and it's, in fact, very common in outer retinal disorders. So this is an example of someone with those continuous photopsias, multiple evanescent white dot syndrome, but uh, it also, we see this also in cancer-associated ret retinopathy. The pearl is that photopsias are non-localizing. The time course is key to diagnosis. Thank you. Thanks, Val. Our, our next speaker will be uh, Dr. Nicholas Volpe from the United States. He'll be giving us pupil pearls.
Maybe those of you who were here for the session earlier heard a lot of the same points that Dr. Trobe made, but I'll take you through it in a slightly different fashion. Uh, nothing relevant in terms of financial disclosure. So here's a case with a pearl. Uh, the first patient here says he's losing vision in his left eye and his pupil's larger. There's some very critical observations to make about this left pupil. And as an important clue, about five months earlier, he took this picture in the mirror, right, so it's flipped. Uh, when he was told by his doctor, he works in construction, uh, that it was just a subconjunctival hemorrhage. Uh, so the people on the panel and some in the audience will recognize this as a case of siderosis, which can cause a dilated pupil. And pearl number one is, uh, never forget this, very rare but important entity not to recognize as a cause for isolated pupil dilation and loss of vision. Uh, I'll take a historical uh, divergence for the second pearl. Uh, so that's R. Marcus Gunn, uh, and here's his paper on the discussion of retroocular uh, neuritis. And the point here is that what he actually described, for those of you who write negative MG pupil in your chart, was not the test that was described in 1959 by Levitan, where the light was moved back and forth. He just described a phenomena where the pupil doesn't hold as well, uh, where the first contraction sees perfectly, there's a difference, a difference in its failure to maintain the contraction. I think this actually might be a Valerie video, but uh, it actually ends up as a swinging test, but you can see how that pupil holds. And what Marcus Gunn described was the difference you'll see in the left eye, where it, it constricts a little but doesn't hold. So he didn't actually move the light back and forth. <coughs> in terms of examining for the afferent pupillary defect, I think it's important that you be consistent, that you make repeated observations, and with all due respect to all of us who think we're experts, sometimes you just can't be sure. It is more a subjective test than you realize, so you have to consider it in context. And I think that for a clinician working, yes, no, and maybe are acceptable endpoints as you try to make decisions. I would urge you to consider testing for the afferent pupillary defect before you gather other information or even know the history so that you can look at it in an objective fashion and recognize that the way our exam rooms are set up, we're often examining from the patient's right and you're a little bit more likely to overcall left afferent and pupillary defects because of the way you direct the light. Pearl number four, of course, is to know your anatomy. Uh, this is pretty basic stuff, but of course, the uh, intrinsically sensitive ganglion cells to the pretectal nuclei to the, I'll pronounce it as Dr. Trobe did, Edendra-Westphal nuclei, um, not the English way of presenting it. Uh, then visceral efferents uh, in the cavernous sinus back to the globe through the ciliary nerves. Uh, is our pupil light reflex. Um, <clears throat> in terms of how this generates relevant clinical pearls, uh, I thought these were important pearls for the way I think about good visual, good vision fields and only question disc pallor, but prominent APD. Valerie talked about a patient with macular finding. Uh, I like recovered optic neuritis for this constellation, early compressive lesions. There may be a way to get an afferent pupillary defect without a vision problem through affecting those tectal pathways in the midbrain. Uh, and perhaps also traumatic optic neuropathy, the APD, a very important finding in that setting. And then Pearl 6, no our, no our APD, but compelling findings. Obviously, bilateral disease, you know, the second eye of an optic neuritis patient, unilateral non-organic vision loss, uh, labor's hereditary optic neuropathy. We saw a few cases and talked about them yesterday where we believe those intrinsically sensitive ganglion cells are spared. So this can be a patient with profound uh, vision loss but no APD. Cortical vision loss, if you have somehow confused uh, hemianopia, uh, these patients won't have afferent pupillary defects. And as Valerie mentioned, when the retina is contributing, uh, you may not have an RAPD. Uh, the finding, again, for the swinging, f oops, uh, swinging flashlight test is uh, pretty uh, generally easily, uh, I'll actually skip it, uh, generated to do that. Um, here's a, a pearl. Uh, I've been struggling for 20 years trying to modernize and accept pupillometry into clinic. Uh, and pupillometry gives absolutely spectacular, accurate, highly sensitive, specific documentation of the afferent pupillary defect. Here's a, a, a light stimulating between, uh, si switching between right and left eye. And you can see when the stimulus is on the left eye, both pupils are dilating, just a nice example of an afferent pupillary defect. Uh, it is now readily, I don't know if there's somebody out there selling them, but readily affordable, easily available, and I don't think it'll ever become part of routine practice because we've all figured out ways to work around it. <coughs> Pearl four, back to anatomy. 
Uh, these are the pathways that affect uh, pupil size. Jonathan talked a lot about these in terms of uh, the sympathetic pathways. I, I'll go through them briefly from the uh, hypothalamus all the way down into the spine, uh, back into the neck through the superior cervical ganglion to the sympathetic pathways uh, that then go through the long ciliary nerves, so to the iris dilator, and then the pupil reflex pathway, which we talked about already, parasympathetics uh, to the constrictor. Uh, Pearl 8, uh, and Jonathan showed this again, everyone has a different version of the flow chart, but this, this literally is everything uh, for the most part that you have to deal with in terms of uh, approaching patients with anisocoria. And the first key uh, observation is the pupil reaction normal. That is, is the anisocoria worse in the light or the dark? Anyone whose anisocoria gets worse in the light, that by definition means their pupil is not constricting normally. Uh, and therefore, we're going to be dealing with things on the efferent side or the uh, uh, iris constrictor side. If the pupil reacts normally to light, then there's nothing wrong with the constrictor, and we're going to be going down the is it a Horner syndrome or physiologic anisocoria, and within the Horner's group, how we might uh, approach these patients. Um, pearl number nine, I would suspect, is that pearl that uh, Horner syndrome is probably, at least if not overdiagnosed, over referred. Uh, here's a patient with uh, ptosis and physiologic anisocoria. Uh, Misha Plesh showed some nice examples of mechanical ptosis. You can see this widened lid crease. This patient would have normal levator function, and if you chose to do it, a negative apraconidine test. We'll talk about that in a minute. This is highly prevalent, 20% of the people in this room. It changes. Sometimes it's right eye, left eye. It can be very variable uh, and may become more pronounced uh, as a patient ages. <coughs> Pearl number 10. Uh, is to always look for associated abnormalities. Uh, Dr. Trobe emphasized that this morning. Uh, obviously, if the pupils are regular, and we have to think about local factors like ischemia, uh, uveitis with posterior synechia, angle closure, those are all fairly straightforward. And of course, the simultaneous presence of uh, ptosis and motility defects are going to take us in a different direction. So be very careful when you're looking at an efferent pupil to consider the slit lamp exam and, of course, the motility. Um, it's remarkable that Valerie and I showed the same picture, therefore I got it from Valerie because we taught in a pupil course at one point. Um, <coughs> so here we are on the flow chart and uh, clinical pearl number 11, uh, which uh, Dr. Trobe made as well. Isolated dilated pupils are not a manifestation of third nerve palsies in a wake alert patient. If you get any phone call on a Friday or you're seeing a patient quickly, my pupil's dilated, once you can rule out a third nerve palsy based on motility, you don't need to worry about an aneurysm. You don't need to worry about anything else. The one exception to that is the patient herniating in an intensive care unit who may, quote, blow their pupil before you can see anything else on exam. So isolated, dilated pupil means not third nerve palsy, but you have to be careful, right? We showed, Misha showed an example of a subtle third nerve palsy. You've got to have your own trick for ruling out a hypotropia and up gaze and a hypertropia and down gaze in the affected eye, whether it's a red glass, a cover test, a Maddox rod, you have to be real careful not to miss these things. <clears throat> Pearl 12, light near dissociation is probably the most important finding uh, to look for in efferent anisocoria. Uh, here is a patient with a light. Here is a people, patient converging. This is light near dissociation. There's no such thing as near light dissociation, right? It's always the near reaction could be better than the light. Uh, and here's the uh, three, four things that we think about. 80s we'll talk about. Dorsal midbrain, Argyle Robinson, and poor vision. So that's pearl 12. Uh, pearl 13, there is another important cause of abnormal pupils and vertical eye movement abnormalities. I've sort of added this to the flow chart here. And this, of course, the dorsal midbrain syndrome in which a patient it's, doesn't project well, but you can see has mid-dilated pupils. They're usually pretty symmetric. They're not big dilated pupils like pharmacologic. Uh, and they often have uh, very clear examples of, good examples of light near dissociation and up gaze limitation. And the classic is a young man uh, with a pinealoma or dysgerminoma uh, that's on the tectal plate uh, that causes this particular pupillary abnormality. <clears throat> In the postganglionic palsy now, we're talking about 80s. So very often, this is again back at the slit lamp, these pupils are rarely round. Take a second and look at the shape of the pupil and you can determine that there are places where the sphincter is working here, where it's constricted and other places where you lose the pupillary rough and it has sort of a more egg-shaped or oval shape. Uh, here's uh, two pictures off and on light, and you can see there's some constriction of the affected pupil here. 
uh, which uh, changes here and here, but the rest of the pupil is not reacting. So looking for segmental contraction of the pupil at the slit lamp, critical finding and identifying ADs tonic pupil. We call it AD syndrome when there's also loss of deep tendon reflexes. Uh, and again, this is not a diagnosis of any concern beyond uh, remembering that it has no overlap with third nerve palsies and uh, generally these patients do quite well over time developing a small uh, pupil that's non-reactive. Uh, li 80s like pupils can happen from people that have had heavy cryo or their retinal treatments that damage the ciliary nerves or as a consequence of some type of intraocular surgery. Uh, it is a rare manifestation of ocular ischemia as could occur with giant cell carotid uh, stenosis. Uh, autoimmune disease, this is probably a similar uh, mechanism. Uh, one of our presenters talked about the Miller-Fisher syndrome. Uh, this can be tested for uh, with CQ1B antibodies. Uh, there's probably a paraneoplastic version of this, but the most common is idiopathic and it's uh, diagnosed with decreased tendon reflexes. Uh, I still do uh, the dilute polycarpine test. If you, can, if you have a bottle of polycarpine around, you just take a 1%, put in seven or eight drops of saline so it's dilute. Uh, and you can demonstrate a nice denervation hypersensitivity uh, with the dilute polycarpine to convince yourself that this is uh, an 80s if you don't have it on, this, on the slit lamp exam. Um, <clears throat> here's another example, again, uh, of uh, a pupil that re respect reacts poorly to light, uh, and uh, again, uh, the contraction would be expected to be uh, segmental. Uh, we went around the room and tried to say who's seeing. I think I am waiting to see my third case. I definitely saw a case when I was a fellow. Uh, I think I saw a second case uh, as a consult uh, on the wards at the University of Pennsylvania, and I have not seen my third case, and I am at doing this for 30 years now. So um, here's an example. Looks like it's from the Iowa collection of an Argyle Robertson pupil. These are small, irregular pupils with light near dissociation. Um, I think it's a reasonable group of patients to consider a differential diagnosis. So. So what I think about in small pupils, often diabetics or chronic tonic pupils, so the 80s pupil, which often becomes bilateral, often kind of rests at a very small size uh, after, it, uh, uh, after it evolves for a number of years. Um, normal size, poorly reactive pupils, again, we talked about uh, dorsal midbrain syndrome. Any patients with bad diabetic or other autonomic neuropathy can have poorly reactive pupils. Uh, and as mentioned, if combined with motility defects acutely with loss of detending reflexes, and ataxia, think about the Miller-Fisher syndrome. Uh, and here's an example of the Miller-Fisher syndrome. Again, darkness, bright, uh, with some near effort, but uh, demonstrating the dilute polycarpine sensitivity. Um, and the reason to recognize this is that you can be ahead and or it can stay isolated to the ophthalmoplegia, and you'll, you'll often get mixed up about myasthenia. Remember, myasthenia doesn't affect the pupils. Um, maybe some overlap with botulinum toxin, but I'm still waiting to see my first case of that. Uh, so this is a very important and not uncommon condition to cause a mixed motility defect that doesn't seem to make sense uh, in a patient with pupils involved. <clears throat> uh, and finally, on to Horner syndrome, ptosis and meiosis. We talked about, and we've heard a little bit about this, the narrowing of the fissure, the inverted ptosis, so the upper, the lower lid actually comes up, uh, and the anisocoria much more pronounced in dim lighting as the calling cards for Horner syndrome as opposed to physiologic anisocoria. Uh, this defect is associated sometimes with a little bit of redness in the eye. The pressure can be a little bit lower in the affected eye acutely, uh, and you want to look for these things. I find that, especially in younger patients, that Horner syndromes are rarely difficult to identify clinically uh, in a patient with new symptoms. Uh, the cocaine test is now, for the most part, uh, been abandoned. It's hard to get your hands on cocaine, and we have the apoclonidine test. Remember, cocaine, cocaine blocks the reuptake, so any patient with a Horner syndrome is going to have a pupil that doesn't react to the cocaine, whereas a normal pupil will dilate. Works better in light-colored irises, irides. Um, <clears throat> Pearl 15 is I always choose apoclonidine. I don't really see children. Uh, I don't know if there's a hard cutoff. People say one year, two years, three years. I wouldn't put apoclonidine in a three-year-old, but I don't see three-year-olds. So you'll have to ask pediatric neuro-ophthalmologists where they put the cutoff. Uh, the test works because of alpha-adrenergic supersensitivity. It doesn't work acutely, so if you're seeing somebody in the first three or four days, you can't depend on the apoclonidine tests. But when you do it, it really has a striking reversal of all types of ptosis, not just a Horner's ptosis, uh, but the reversal of the anisocoria 
uh, is what becomes very striking. It's a very effective dilator of a denervated pupil. So again, back to the operconidine test is Pearl 15. Uh, Pearl 16, I don't think this entity has come up, but uh, you will go to the emergency room and be the first person to diagnose a Wallenberg syndrome or a Pike or Stroke syndrome uh, based on the presence of a Horner syndrome. They can sort of slip through the other experts in the emergency room uh, because some of their other neurologic symptoms are difficult to characterize. Uh, so this lateral medullary infarct is characterized by a Horner syndrome on that side, facial anesthesia, ataxia, and contralateral semi, uh, sensory symptoms. Uh, so you might be the person to put this together first by recognizing uh, some unusual nystagmus along with the Horner syndrome. Uh, last two, Pearl 17. Um, if it's a painful Horner syndrome, always consider carotid dissection. Here's two examples. Again, the sort of crescent uh, bright signal in the T1-weighted MRI scan of the neck. This is really important. You know, if you think about all the patients with carotid dissection, it's a relatively small percentage that have strokes on one hand. On the other hand, carotid dissection is probably the most common cause for stroke in young people. So there's so much overlap there that this is not something, while, it, while it's not something that has been clinically proven to be a diagnosis that can be more advantaged with anticoagulant treatment, and some people might just say aspirin, it's clearly something that you don't want to let out of your office without a stroke-oriented neurologist making a decision about whether anything can be done to uh, increase their chances of not having a stroke. <clears throat> Finally, Pearl 18, uh, Horner syndrome. Many times you just have to do the imaging to be safe. Certainly none, none of us, I think, in the audience yesterday were localizing with Paradrin. It's not available. Uh, in the end, uh, basically some type of image from hypothalamus to the top of the spine to include the lung, as in this patient with a Pankos tumor, is going to be what you have to do in a patient who you're convinced has a Horner syndrome and you don't have an explanation. Many can be vasculopathic, but we don't go there without imaging uh, in most situations. So our take-home message is after 18 pearls later, Know your anatomy, both the ciliary ganglion efferent arc and the uh, Horner's arc. Keep the APD in perspective. I just find that we're all obsessed about it in the presence of it. And we all show it in great examples of it. But in the end, I'll scout's honor. There are times where I can't be sure and I have to make decisions independent of my thoughts about the pupil. Um, light and dark is to decide which way to go with the pupil. Uh, be sure it's not a third nerve palsy. Look for light near dissociation. Uh, Horner syndrome, probably overdiagnosed, but it's a high stakes condition, uh, particularly in the presence of pain where you have to think about carotid dissection. Thank you. Our last speaker will be uh, Dr. Prem Subramanian from the United States, and he'll talk on pearls and OCT. I have no financial disclosures. I'm going to talk about the utility of OCT for optic nerve diseases to understand some of the limitations. So what can't OCT help you to do? What are the pearls there? Because it's as important to know what it can do as to, as to know what it can't. Describe some different scans. We're neuro-ophthalmologists, we love the optic nerve, but I'll talk about how macular scans can help us as well, and then to interpret some of the evolving methods. Typically, when we think of OCT and neuroophthalmology, we are thinking of the peripapillary retinal nerve fiber layer measured by a 3.4 millimeter scan around the optic disc, the segmentation and analysis. And in many ways, the way we use this typical OCT in neuroophthalmology is not that much different than, say, you might use it in glaucoma. If you look at the scan at the bottom, you see this patient has some superior thinning of the retinal nerve fiber layer and had, had corresponding inferior visual field loss. Fine, but the OCT doesn't tell you what the underlying pathogenic process is. So don't confuse an OCT finding with an actual pathogenesis. That still has to come from what you learned from Carl, from the history, from what you learned from Valerie in terms of the exam findings that will help you to do that. OCT of the macula doing the standard grid, we use this in our ophthalmology, not necessarily to look at the total retinal thickness or total macular thickness, but as I will show you, to look at the ganglion cell complex, the ganglion cell inner plexiform layer complex, which has a relationship to optic nerve structure and may help us to understand why patients present with certain visual complaints. Again, it's not going to give us a diagnosis, it's going to help us in establishing a diagnosis with the other information that you have. 
one challenge that we face as ophthalmologists is differentiating swollen from typically or simply elevated optic nerves. Can OCT help us to do that? The answer is maybe. I'll show you some evidence for that. These on FOSS images on top and bottom show you one optic nerve that's swollen and one optic nerve that's elevated from two different patients. Can you tell them apart? I don't think I can very easily. And if you look, the numbers are hard to see, but the top one has 119 micron nerve fiber layer thickness, the bottom is 118. So you can't tell them apart on the basis of retinal nerve fiber layer analysis alone. So what might help you? If you take the macular scan and you put it over the optic disc, you can see that there's a wider halo of abnormality in that top disc than there is in the bottom disc. And when we analyzed that, and we looked at patients who were normal, patients who had pseudopapilledema, and patients who had papilledema, if you look just at the retinal nerve fiber layer, there's a lot of overlap. If you look at that inner ring, there's a lot of overlap. You can't tell them apart. But if you look, perhaps, at that outer ring, in that macular scan, and you look at the volume analysis that the instrument gives you, about 85% of the time you can separate papilledema from pseudopapilledema. Is it perfect? No. The pearl I want to leave you with is that if you see that there is a significant volume increase in a patient, that can help you to determine that they may have real papilledema. But if they fall into that overlap zone here, that's not going to help you, and don't be misled. There are some other things that we have done to try to separate papilledema from pseudopapilledema. Can you use OCT to do this? Again, I'm showing you some research that we've done because you'll see that, but I want to relate it to what you're doing in the clinic. Can you use this on a given patient? And that's where the problem, I think, arises a lot with OCT. We do these studies where we look at a range of patients and we publish a range of data that show you that okay, if you take 50 patients, I can separate out papilledema from pseudopapilledema. This is an example here where we looked in the macula of patients with papilledema and pseudopapilledema and found that patients with papilledema actually had some loss in their macula in the temporal quadrant here of just the ganglion cell complex, some thinning compared to patients who had pseudopapilledema. But do I recommend that you use this to differentiate papilledema from pseudopapilledema in a patient walking in the door to see you tomorrow or Monday when you go back to your office? No, I don't think so because it is not at that level yet. So the pearl I leave you with here is use this information, read this information, but don't rely on it because it's going to mislead you if you use this as the sole piece of information to make a diagnosis. Now one area where I do think you can use OCT quite reliably is the detection of optic disc drusen. Now, optic disc drusen, when you see them on, this is a enhanced depth imaging OCT, a spectral domain OCT through the optic nerve, and the arrow is pointing to a well-circumscribed hypoechoic area or hyper, hyperdense hyper area with some signal within it. Now, don't be misled, though. The pearl here is that is not disc drusen, what the other arrow points to. That is a hyper reflective collection likely of retinal nerve fibers that are folded upon themselves whenever you get an abnormality at the optic disc. And so you need to know what you are looking at in order to make the diagnosis here. So the thing on the side here, not drusen, this is an optic disc drusen. And some other examples here, you can see disc drusen here with hyper and hyper hypoechoic areas, similarly here defined with within the opening of the Brooks membrane. You see additional drusen here, additional drusen here, and then deep buried drusen are sometimes nicely demonstrated with enhanced depth imaging. So if done properly, I do feel that OCT is helpful in the diagnosis of optic disc drusen. Now I'm going to switch gears here. How else clinically might you use OCT when you see a patient with a neuroophthalmic disorder? It's been suggested that OCT can predict visual recovery in patients who have an optic neuropathy. And specifically, 
in a study of patients who had a pituitary tumor, it was shown that in a small series of patients who were valued before and after surgery, if they had a nerve fiber layer thickness of greater than 80 microns to the right of that green line, almost all of them, all of them actually recovered vision. If they were to the left of that line, only one of the patients who had thinner nerve fiber layer had visual field recovery. And it didn't matter if their visual field was really bad or not so bad before they had surgery. If their nerve fiber layer was normal, they were very likely to recover visual field. This was replicated in another study where they compared patients with bad nerve fiber layer and bad visual fields with patients who had good nerve fiber layer and bad visual fields and looked at relative recovery. So is this a certainty? If your patient comes to see you and they have visual field loss and a nerve fiber layer thickness of less than 80 microns, do they have no hope for recovery? No, and that's not the message I want to leave you with. I want to leave you with the message that if they have a good nerve fiber layer, they are very likely to recover. But if they have a thinned nerve fiber layer, their prognosis is more uncertain. This is a patient who came to see me because she was having trouble driving, a woman in her mid-30s. She had normal visual acuity had not noticed this bitemporal hemianopia that was detected on visual field testing. Like Valerie told you, the patient had seen another ophthalmologist who said he, she was 20-20 and didn't pick up on this because a visual field wasn't done. She had this tumor that was found when I sent her for an MRI, compressing her optic chiasm, and the OCT, this was an older OCT at the time, showed thinning, especially in her right eye. So did this predict that she would not recover visual field? No, it didn't. So she had surgery. The chiasm is now nicely decompressed, and these were her postoperative visual fields. So the cautionary pearl I leave you with, good normal OCT with a visual field, patients are likely to recover. Bad OCT, OCT with thinning and visual field defect, they still might recover, but their prognosis is a little more guarded. We looked at this in patients with more chronic compression, patients with a meningioma. We looked at patients comparing normal to thin retinal nerve fiber layer. They were similar in terms of age and such. What we found, not surprisingly, patients with a thin nerve fiber layer had worse vision. They had worse color vision. So still check all of these things. They had worse visual fields. But then the OCT did predict that those patients who had better nerve fiber layer were more likely to recover, but some patients recovered anyway, and this just looks like a scattering. So I leave you again, don't over-rely on your OCT to predict visual recovery. I'll move now to the macular ganglion cell complex, the macula, and give you what I think are some pearls of how to analyze that, how to use it in evaluating patients and determining if their vision loss is coming from an optic nerve problem or elsewhere and what their prognosis might be. It may be complementary to retinal nerve fiber layer. It's only available with the spectral domain instruments. And so in if you take a patient who has an abnormal retinal nerve fiber layer analysis and then you do a ganglion cell complex analysis, you may see that there is significant loss in the ganglion cell complex. If it is early in their disease, you may see that the ganglion cell complex starts to thin before the retinal nerve fiber layer thins. You have to be careful, though, because the ganglion cell complex analysis can be altered by non-optic nerve things. This is a patient you can see in their left eye, the ganglion cell complex is normal and the macula is structurally normal. Here, there's a subretinal process, but that makes the ganglion cell complex look abnormal because the machine then abnormally segments the image. So you have to be, again, very careful and look not just at these scans and these analyses, but look at the actual images themselves so you don't miss a attribute the problem to the optic nerve. A couple of other cases where OCT, I think, can help us in patients who have newly discovered problems. This 33-year-old woman was referred to me because she went for a routine eye exam. She had had no problems, and for unclear reasons, she had visual field testing performed. 
and the visual field testing showed a left homonymous hemianopia. This patient had driven there. She was completely unaware of this. She had never had any problem in her life with her vision. And so we decided to look, when I looked at the retina, it looked normal, looked at the optic nerve, it looked normal. She, had, uh, she also came with this macular ganglion cell complex analysis, which showed that there was a similar thinning of the macular ganglion cell complex in her retina. And we wondered why this might be. And when we did get an MRI scan because of her homonymous hemianopia, what it showed us is that she seemed to have cortical atrophy, occipital lobe atrophy on the right side that went along with her left homonymous hemianopia. And this was transsynaptic degeneration back to the retina that resulted in the loss of the ganglion cells. It told us that this was a really old problem. This was something she had likely been born with and that this was not something new. And she had been told by the referring doctor that she probably had a tumor or a stroke or MS or something really bad. And so we were able to use all of this information together. But again, remember, the OCT was only one piece of information that helped us to do this. Finally, OCT, along with the history, along with the exam, can help you to reassess when a patient's history and exam don't make sense. This was a 22-year-old woman. She had had vision loss in her right eye. She had had some paresthesias in her upper extremities. Her mother had MS. So she was diagnosed with optic neuritis. She got an MRI and a lumbar puncture that were normal. Her visual acuity was uh, 20-50, about 6-18 almost, with a right RAPD suggesting an optic nerve problem, but her optic nerve looked normal. So she was told, well, your optic nerve looks normal, but you have an RAPD and decreased vision. You have atypical optic neuritis, which is a little bit of a stretch. But nonetheless, it, she was told it was atypical. And this was her OCT of her retinal nerve fiber layer. And you can see it's quite normal in both eyes, 118 microns here, 101 microns. If anything, a little bit thickened in that right eye. And then subsequently, after her disease resolved, she still had a normal retinal nerve fiber layer, but yet she had this visual field defect that persisted. And in fact, her visual field defect kept getting worse, and she kept getting told that she had an atypical optic neuritis, even though the OCT was showing that she had a normal optic nerve, nerve fiber layer thickness, and when you looked in her eye, the color of her optic nerve was normal. So how did OCT help us here? Well, that normal nerve fiber layer thickness, look how nasty that, that segmentation looks. The machine is having a lot of trouble segmenting that. And why is it having trouble segmenting that? Well, if you look at the macula, you see that there's this severe loss of outer retina in this patient and some microcystic changes within the macula. So we were being fooled by the OCT of the optic nerve. The problem was in the retina and in fact, when an autofluorescence photograph and then fluorescein angiography was done, this patient had a retinal vasculitis that was causing severe retinal disease, peripheral retinal loss, non-perfusion, and the loss of her visual field. So the OCT helped us here in a way when we looked at the right part of the OCT, when we stopped focusing in too much on the optic nerve and looked at all of the information in front of us. So OCT does have diagnostic and prognostic usages, but there is no OCT that's going to tell you what the patient has. The OCT can only help you to make a diagnosis, to differentiate perhaps among different types of optic nerve disease, and you need a structure function correlation to put everything together and use this to make your uh, diagnosis and to help your patients. Thank you.